uh, quite a few views on our channel of the different services. Now, turning your hymn goes to number 27, or if you prefer, look in the uh, bulletin here. The words are on the second page there, all creatures of our God and King. This is our call to worship. We've had a different one every month, but uh, I've got people suggesting uh, different songs, and you know, that will, that will not allow us to get to all of them once a month, so we may change it every week. I'll just wait and see, but got a lot of good uh, input there. Let's stand together as we sing hymn number 27. <laughs> Oh, so 
Thanks, Lord. Uh, I want to formally introduce Billy Skinner. Uh, <clears throat> he's been here before, so you probably uh, already know him, but he is uh, now in Millington, Tennessee. And uh, he has uh, been involved in associational work. Uh, there's a boys' ranch, he said, close to his home. Uh, he's come here today to bring us a message, and I think it's about. If I got it right, I put it in the bulletin because Jack told me this too while I was driving, and I didn't write it down either. <clears throat> but he said, if I could do it over again, that's close. If I could raise them over again. Oh, if I could raise them <laughs> over again. Well, that even makes pretty it close. Close. That's pretty close. <clears throat> uh, but if I could raise them over again. So, uh, <clears throat> those of you who are here that have children and some with grandchildren that you raise, feel like you raise, uh, this should be a very, very meaningful, meaningful worship service and message. Billy, after uh, <clears throat> our next hymn, we'll have the special music and you come and bring us God's message that he put on your heart today. Thank you for being here. Now, let's sing our next hymn, hymn number 504, God Give Us Christian Homes. <clears throat> Thank mm -hmm.
music, special music today, is God will make a way. And He has made a way for all of us. I think we can all relate to the fact that there are many times in life when we just wonder if there is a way. <clears throat> and we lose our way because we lose sight of <clears throat> what's important in life. I may lose my voice into this, but I do. You listen to Melissa play <clears throat> and, uh, and just sing along with her in your, in your mind and your heart. <clears throat> Everybody hear me? Yep. James Dobson tells a story. He said he was uh, <clears throat> doing this children's camp. And uh, Christian's children's camp. And he was just kind of fishing around. And he said, uh, this one little boy said, can you tell me what 
climbs trees and has a bushy tail and eats nuts. The little boy said, well, it sounds like a squirrel, but I'm going to say Jesus. <laughs> Sometimes we feel like we do have those answers. I do appreciate being back. You know, anybody can get invited the first time, but if you get invited back the second time, you feel like you've at least done something right. And uh, I am uh, so proud of you and what God is doing here. It is real a real blessing to uh, to hear Jack talk about you and how faithful you are and how God has blessed him here. He is a special guy, a very good friend of mine. He asked me to do something related to the family. And uh, I guess I would entitle this, this message also Reflections because when you get my age and some of your age, you do a lot of reflection, don't you? The title of the message is, If I Could Raise Them Again. If I could raise my children all over again, what would I do? The scripture is found in Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And what I'm going to say this morning will not be complex, it will not be complicated, and maybe a lot of it you've heard before, but you know, I really don't think it has to have four syllables and five moving parts for it to be significant. You know, there are only three pure colors, and just look what Michelangelo did with those, Raphael, Casa. There are only seven notes on the piano. <laughs> and just look what Brahms did with them. Beethoven did with them. Look what Elvis did with two. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be profound to be important. Can anything in the world be more important than salvation? God's love for you and God's love for me, can anything be more profound and yet so simple as that? The title of the message is, If I Could Raise Them Again, I have helped raise, raise two children and I have made every mistake that you can imagine. A boy and a girl, I've been tough. I said, you know, you've got to shape up or ship out. The baby buyer truck is coming by in the morning and he's not going to have to offer me very much so you better shape up. I admit there were times when, when I wanted my children to like me and I was inconsistent. I gave them things that I guess I considered substitutes for love because I didn't have the time to invest in them. And... I wonder why I did that. I think maybe I did that because that's the way I was raised. You know, you learn what you live and you live what you learn. I really wish that, that I had been as smart as my four-year-old thought I was and half as stupid as my 15-year-old thought I was. There's a man by the name of Jack Moore, not the one that, that you know, another one. He wrote a little book. And in that book, he talks about two teenagers, and these two teenagers are talking. And one said, you know, I'm really worried about my parents. My dad works 10 and 12 hours a day. Then he comes home and cuts the yard and takes care of the car. My mom, she works all the time. Then she comes home and cooks and takes care of the house. And they're both trying to save enough money to send me to college. The second teenager said, well, what's wrong with all that? He said, I'm afraid they'll escape. <laughs> Will Rogers gives some good advice for, for raising children. He said, when they get 12 years old, put them in a barrel, seal up the barrel, cut a hole in the middle of the barrel, and feed them through that hole. When they get 15, plug up the hole. <laughs> if I could raise them again, I really don't think there's much wrong in America that some good fathers could not cure. Several years ago, there was 
an article in Newsweek magazine about, about dads. And it said that on the very front of the magazine it says, Dads are destiny. It's dads that chromosomes, it's dads chromosomes that determine whether that child is boy or girl. The article went on to, to say that it is dad most of the time that determines masculinity, effeminity, effeminity, passion. Dads are destiny. It's the same way with daughters. So much of what they know and what they do is determined by, determined by dads. Dads cause children to carry more baggage into life, adult life, than anyone else. Things like anger, resentment, poor self-image. Dads are destiny. In 1960, 17% of families live without dads. In 2002, 40%. And it's over 50% now. Dads are destiny. Do you know if a child gets saved, there's a 3% chance that the rest of the family will follow. If mom gets saved, there's a 33% chance that she will follow. If dad gets saved, there's a 93% chance that the rest of the family will follow. Dads are destiny. If I could raise them again, I would never say, go ask your mother. Certainly, that has to be made in concert with the mom and the dad. That's the way decisions are made. And then they come out unified with one decision. I'm not saying that it's easy. It's not easy. No marriage is easy. <clears throat> Maybe not as difficult as the one marriage that I heard about. The man who joined the church and he came to see his pastor, he said, Pastor, he said, uh, I really think my wife's trying to poison me. The pastor said, oh, <laughs> you, I know you haven't been here very long and I don't know you very well, but I really don't think your wife's trying to poison you. Well, I, I really think she is, and I want you to call her this afternoon and talk to her, and I'm coming back <coughs> tomorrow afternoon and talk to you. So we came back the next, next afternoon and said, Pastor, did you talk to my wife? He said, yes, I talked to your wife for almost three hours. My advice is take the poison. <laughs> <laughs> now, ladies, that's a joke. <laughs> If I could raise them again, I would lead better. Secondly, if I could raise them again, my children would never be status symbols. Psalm 127, 3. Children are a gift from God. Even though Susie's only three years old, <coughs> Mom spends $150 for those glitter-covered sneakers. And then she justifies it. This is what she says. Even three, four, and five years old, five-year-olds are label conscious. At our nursery school, there's parental pressure to be elegant. I really wonder, does a three-year-old know what elegant means? Can they really understand elegant? I truly believe the best thing we can give our children is a biblical picture that is presented in Psalm 139. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And you really can't give them, you just have to help them understand it and discover it. But if they have that, they'll never compare themselves to another person. Because it's, it's that deep down below inside feeling of self-worth. I am somebody. If they fail... They're defeated. They can learn from that experience. They can appreciate their uniqueness and not be jealous of someone else. Feel good about themselves without recognition. You know I appreciate being a grandparent. Don't you? <laughs> I know you can spoil them and take them home. I understand that. But I don't try to control them. I don't have any huge ambitions for them. 
I, I don't want to make them over. I, I just want to love them and enjoy them. If I could raise them again, I'd be a better leader. They would never be status symbols. Number three, I would listen more. When you love someone, you listen. For some reason, Dad seems to think that, well, you know, I got two ears and once to listen to that child and once to listen to Fox News. Don't bother me. I'm watching the news right now. Just give me a little time, maybe later. Whenever we meet with our kids, we, we need to listen. We need to try to understand what they're saying. I think maybe we just need to shut up, open our two ears, open our two eyes, and ask questions. It's amazing what you can learn asking questions from children. And I think maybe if we ask those questions and talk to them, we can better understand their behavior. I can assure you, we all have flaws and children have flaws. They're going to spill the milk, right? They're going to turn the Kool-Aid over. But that would never justify you calling them stupid and lazy and ugly. A child should never be disciplined for that. A child should never be surprised when they're disciplined. Never. Because there ought to be boundaries. You set the boundaries. And you say you get outside these boundaries, then you will be disciplined. <laughs> Scripture says, even a child knows by his or her action whether his conduct is pure or right. When they drop food on the floor, that's being childish. When they take their plate, they throw it across the table and hit their brother, that's being foolish. We punish them for being foolish, but not being childish. If I could start all over again, raising my children, I would love my wife more in front of my children. I would laugh more at my mistakes. You see, when you laugh at your weaknesses, you reach the heart. If you laugh and talk about your successes, you just touch the head. I would point them to God more often. I would help them to understand that rebellion is running away from a character-building God. God is in the process of developing my character and your character and your children's character. <coughs> You're not going to take your career to heaven. You're going to take your character to heaven. That's all you're going to take. And God's in the process of honing our character now. And boy, do we need men and women of character and integrity and honesty. I could raise them again, I'd lead better. They would never be status symbols and I would listen more. Number four, if I could raise my children again, they would never be, they would, they would understand that success is a process. Success is a process. It's, it's not a status. You, you cannot go to success. You cannot ride in success. You cannot live in success. That does not mean success. You can only feel good about yourself and what you're doing right now. And enjoy the journey. And you've got to feel good about yourself before you can give it away. You can't give away what you don't have. We need to teach our children it does not matter what they look like. It does not matter what position they have. 
It is how they feel about themselves at that moment and try to make them feel better about themselves. That's what we should be teaching our children. We are, we are redeemed people. We're men and women of God. And we need to live like it. And we need to act like it. Every message I've ever preached on parenting or families, I say this, and I repeat it over and over again. Your children, your kids, young people need three things. They need affection. They need admiration. And they need affirmation. How do I give them affection? I simply say, I love you. How do I give them admiration? I say, I'm proud of you. How do I affirm them? I say, you are good at blank. All children are good something. I love you. I am proud of you. And you're good at this. But you know, everything that I've ever said really requires some effort. You can't just give it lip service. You know, I noticed when I did not show up for piano recitals at both of them, had them, ball games, teachers' meetings, when I didn't show up for those things, all those things I said didn't matter at all. I remember we were living in Steel, Missouri, my first church, and my son was running track. And I told him, I would be at his track meet. It was about 60 miles away in, in, in another city. And I got real busy and I was running late. And when I finally got the track meet, I looked down on, on the field and there he was. He was looking every direction. Not because he was nervous. He was looking for me. And finally he saw me. His whole countenance changed. Everything changed. Simply because I was there. Dads, moms, we need to show up. We need to be there. Grandparents. There was a family in San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, the family there was committed to the Lord. They had a son by the name of David Kraft. His father was a pastor. A godly pastor in the South Bay Area. David Kraft grew up in, with parents who constantly reminded him of their faithfulness to God. And they wanted to, David to live the same kind of life that they lived. He grew up loving Jesus, just like his parents. He was a big boy, six foot, about six foot two, weighed a little bit over 200 pounds. He finally decided to go to seminary, so he went to... Uh, to Denver Conservative Baptist Theological Seminary. And uh, he majored in ministry there, not particularly preaching, but different kinds of ministry. He was six foot two, weighed about a little over 200 pounds. And he graduated and he started working for Fellowship of Christian Athletes and went all over the world. Then when he got 32 years old, that dear boy was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. And it racked his body, took his hair, drained his energy. Over a period of time, he went from 200 down to, to 88 pounds, lying in the hospital. He looks at his dad, he said, Dad, do you remember when I was just a little boy? How you used to hold me in your arms, close to your chest? Dad nodded. David said, Dad, do you think you could do that one more time? So he reached down in the bed. He pulled that 32-year-old, 88-pound son up to his chest, their chest to chest, eyeball to eyeball. Tears streaming down their eyes. And David said this, thank you. 
for building the kind of character in my life that can enable me to face even a moment like this. Our task as parents and grandparents is to transfer God's truth from one generation to the other. Building that character that will enable our children to face even the greatest storms of life and stay faithful and stay firm in our faith. Not long ago I read an article about Gigi, the daughter of Billy Graham. And she was talking about her heritage. She was talking about her, her parents, the way she was raised. And she said this. She said, the most important thing you can take to heaven with you is your children. The most important thing you can take with you to heaven is your children. If I could raise them over again. If you could raise them over again. And you know, every one of us look back and we see some mistakes we made, don't we? We see some things we might correct. And the last thing I want you to do here, to leave here today, is leave here beat up. Because you know what we did? We did the best we could with what we had. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the kind of God we have. I made some mistakes. You made some mistakes. But I can assure you, I've given them to God. And they're as far as the east is from the west. Let's try it. Father, you are a good father. You're a loving father. All-knowing, all-seeing, omnipotent. And we praise you for the love that you shower on us every day. Father, I just pray that uh, you will guide us, <clears throat> help us to be people that glorify you, I thank you, Father, for this congregation, the way you've blessed them. And I just pray that you will continue to bless them as they pour their lives into this church. Father, I pray for someone here this morning, they're dealing with something in their life that they need to turn over to you, that they'll allow the Holy Spirit to speak to them, convict them, and convince them. Father, we just want to walk with you and serve you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <coughs> Do we stand? Or? Yes. Stand together as we sing our invitational hymn. I'd be glad to pray with you if you'd like for me to. Hymn we'll number 305, I have decided to follow Jesus. We'll just sing one stanza. Hey, if God has spoken to you some way, we, we invite you to come. <laughs> I have decided to follow Jesus. I have Some of us truly wish that we could have that chance to do it all over again, but we can still stand faithful today Amen. as we uh, as we reach out to first our families and to others. 
before I dismiss us in prayer, Carol, are we supposed to have something this coming weekend? Or was that yesterday? That was yesterday. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, that was yesterday. We had a big boy. I just said we missed you. Okay. We had a, a yard sale, a rummy sale, um, to kind of clean out and declutter. And uh, hopefully <laughs> we did a little of that. I apologize that I've been so tied up. You know, this thing about <laughs> getting too busy sometimes hits close to home with me. And uh, I hope uh, hope that that's something we all go away with today. Let's be dismissed. Lord, we thank you so much. We think back over the years and realize that you have been so good to us. Lord, you know, we have made so many mistakes, but we know that you love us, and you're there with us through every one of those. And sometimes, through those mistakes, we learn things, we become closer to you, and we know that that's in your plan. Lord, I just pray that regardless of where we've come from, the mistakes we've made that today we're going to leave here. We're going to look to you strongly more to you for guidance in the difficult decisions uh, we face in life. But just like that young man told his dad, you know, can you do it one more time? The things that you taught me allow me to face this. And we will face those challenges. And Lord, we know as believers that you're there with us every step of the way. And those challenges, even though they're difficult, we get through. And we look back and we see your hand in it. Lord, help us to stay focused on you. And Lord, help us here at Marigold Baptist Church to stay focused on what we're here for. That is to glorify you in all that we do and to reach out and to share what you've blessed us with with everyone we come in contact with. Lord, as we, um, as we work together here as a family, give us the courage, the desire, the inspiration um, to lift you up in all that is done and help us to walk in our personal lives in a way that it does glorify you. Be with us as we depart today. We go our separate ways. Bring us back together here tonight for worship. And be with Jack and Marsh as they travel today. We just thank you for them and what they mean to us individually and as a church family. Give them safe traveling. Give Brother Billy safe traveling as he returns home today. We thank you so much for him and his ministry and what he does as he seeks to continue to reach out to those and share your word with them. Thank you so much for all that you do for us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs>